<laughs> I'm not going to hear from him again, you know. But uh, it, it was true that uh, Wednesday night came, he had, was there with his big Lincoln, step in, and we went to one of the uh, most beautiful areas of Montreal. Um, and uh, the place was a mansion. A mansion is usually very large, we'll, we call this a little, a small mansion. It was beautiful, most beautiful place. Yeah. Roger, your friend George took you and Roland to this mansion where people worshipped the demons. Mm -hmm. What was it like there? What kind of people were there? Well, it was a uh, big surprise for me as I kind of made up my mind an idea that they were going to be rough looking characters. But as we entered the place, I was amazed to see that they were all very well dressed, well mannered. And that a lot of the people, as we were in being introduced to people, were professionals, doctors, attorneys, a uh, lot of business people. And see what they had, they had a praise session to the gods, which is the uh, spirit counselors, which are in charge of legions of, of spirits, yeah. of demon spirits. And uh, they talk about what the, the Lord of their lives has done for them. Because they call on particular spirits, uh, like uh, um, the god Nehoshtan, which you read in Second King about the Israelites uh, worship the golden serpent that Moses had made. Mm -hmm. Well, behind, behind the spirit worship, they, behind that they were worshiping the serpent. They were actually worshiping uh, this uh, spirit Nehoshtan, and the same spirit Nehoshtan is. The press was telling us that the medical doctor that was telling us how he was making operations that had never been made before because people had to be uh, awake, and have no have no no feeling. He was able to uh, you know carry on the surgeries that had not been done before, mm -hmm. but the spirits would give that capacity to be able to uh, operate without people feeling uh, any pain and things, and also without uh, no problem with the, with the blood because as he would cut his incision because the incisions. Everything open and with no blood running. Mm -hmm. So you could do the work that has not been done before. So. Now, I recall reading in your book that at this um, praise worship service they had, they would sing hymns. Why would they sing hymns in a demon worship? Yeah. Um, this was kind of a big surprise to me when I went at the place. The priest said, hey, let's go down to the worship room of the gods and uh, have a praise session, you know, a singing session. So we go down there, and what do you think, you think did they pass around? Church hymnals. You know, Christian church hymnals. And I couldn't believe this. I said, what's his business? So the priest says, well, now, he says, for those of you that are new, <laughs> let me tell you that this is the most feasible way, he says, to please the spirits. It's to deride Christ and his people, you know, and his church and all that. So they sing... Uh, uh, out of Christian uh, hymnals, they didn't sing Christian words to the hymns. However, well, they changed they changed a lot of the, a lot of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and not it's a form of it's a form of blasphemy. Yeah. Mm. Such as you see today in the rock music world, you see the the entertainers they have these crosses. Mm -hmm. Ladies got earrings, crosses. Mm -hmm. The guys got the cross. This is a form of blasphemy, a, a, a form of deriding Christ. You see. Spirits uh, cause the people to do that, to find pleasure in wearing this type of uh, uh, emblem, which is the, the cross is the emblem of the crucifixion of Christ huh, to the Christians. Mm -hmm. So what were your impressions the first time you went down into that worship room? Well, it was, uh, we'd been there maybe a half a dozen times, and uh, the high priest uh, told us after the meeting was over, he wanted to talk to us my friend and I. So after the most we let left, he says, uh, the master of my life has revealed to me that it is time for you people to become acquainted with the worship room of the gods. Well, we started to move toward a beautiful uh, um, grand staircase. Beautiful. The banister was, was huge. It was massive. And the Iron, uh, wrought iron work that they had done in it was a super. The beautiful decorations on the walls, 
the chandelier on the first landing. It was the first landing. About you go down about eight or ten steps, and you had the first landing. It was huge and beautiful. The the light arrangement was the nicest I had ever seen in my life. When we got into this this uh, sanctuary area, it wasn't very brightly lit, but everything was uh, well magnified. Uh, the beauty of uh, certain things, uh, you know, like uh, uh, a lot of the things were gold plated or gold trims. You see, the little altars where you had they had the, the spirits that had materialized the the, uh, the you see. The little altars where you had they had the, the spirits that had materialized, the the, uh, the photographed them, and then they had paintings made of them. And there was um, probably about maybe a hundred of those around the place. Sort of like a shrine. Yeah, and underneath there was a little altar where you have an incense and uh, things that they would use in their in their prayer sessions and things like that, devotions to, to certain spirits. And uh, some of the objects in there the priest said were solid gold. Mm. It, was, it was a unique experience to see that. So how did you feel when you walked into that room? I um, felt that uh, these people had power and they had a lot of it. Did that attract you? Uh, yes and no. You had mixed feelings about it? I had it. mixed feelings about it. Yeah. Because, uh, to a certain extent, things looked so good and sounded so good to us. But you see, I'd been brought up in a Christian home where my parents had told us we were eight children in the family, and especially the, the older ones, you know. Uh, my dad says, well, you know, if you get involved in wrongdoing, you're going to have to pay the price. There's always a cost for everything in this world. So, this thought kept creeping to my mind. Just how far you go with these spirits before we can start paying the price. See? So it made you just a little bit nervous. Oh, yes. But yet you kept going back. Oh, there was no way out. Because that's what we were told. You knew at that time. Yeah. So you were moving forward more on fear. More on fear, yes. Because the, the high priest said that the, the master had special plans for us in our lives. And that no one ever went into this society unless they were invited by the spirits. See, so that was made very clear. And he also expressed to us the danger, explained to us the danger of uh, uh, going against the will of the spirits. And he mentioned about this one uh, man and his wife that live in a fireproof building in Montreal. The place burned right down with him in it. Mm -hmm. He was one of their members that had decided that, well, he wanted to think things over. He, he was not going to get initiated at the time that the spread it said he would like him to be initiated in the, into the society. So in reality, Roger, you were chosen mm -hmm. by high-powered demon spirits yeah. to be a part of their human, special, privileged mm -hmm. group. You see, these people in Montreal, the society, uh, like the priest mentioned, there's thousands of spirit worshippers in only different societies of spirit worshippers in this world. But, he says, we are the elite. We know the real truth about the Master and his angels. And they are not idiot looking beings. They are gorgeous creatures. And from the paintings that they had on the, on that, in, on the wall of that walls of that worship room, they were unique big beings. Especially, the, there was a painting full, uh, you know, full, full size, length. full length painting of, of uh, the Father Lucifer above his altar. And that was very fascinating, because he looked like a man of great intellect, high forehead, the way that he looked with his eyes, the way he had the eyes looking. It uh, gave you a depth of perception of somebody that is very, very knowledgeable and powerful. And, pow and powerful, yeah. So, Roger, this high priest that you talked about, he is the one that ushered you down into the worship room. Mm -hmm. Was he also the one that led out in the praise sessions that you talked about? Yes, and he had an assistant also, another priest. Okay. Now, when you would go to these praise sessions, mm -hmm. what kinds of things happened at those, at those sessions? Well, there's a lot of uh, success stories. Positive mental attitude kinds of things? 
Well, yes, a lot of success stories. Uh, the, the masters has done this for me and not for me. I remember one uh, lumber dealer, he had like half a dozen different operations from the Quebec. And uh, everything that he touched seemed to turn to money. So, and he was telling about it. And then there's uh, this other person that was the clairvoyant that uh, would work only for the wealthy people, only for the super wealthy. He says, I have the know-how, they have the means, let them pay. So he advised in, in business transactions. They would come to him and say, listen, I, I look at this deal that I might get, you know, this factory or whatever it is, that because this guy was, this person was interested in industrial real estate, see. And he would talk to the spirit and then he would, the spirit was audible to him. See, you could hear the spirit talk to him, but the, the, the man did not hear. So the spirit was telling what was telling the, the uh, clairvoyant what uh, well he called himself an astrologer, reading the moons and the stars and you know. Now what was the term you used for his title, this man? Clairvoyant. Clairvoyant. Oh, clairvoyant. Clairvoyant. Okay. Yes, and uh, it was interesting. This person uh, stood up and says, hey, "I had a nice little experience last week." And he says, "The master," he says, "They take care of you." This lady and her husband brought him uh, to this astrologer a bundle of money. They said, this is the deal that you... And he works at, uh, only on percentages. Only on percentages. He does, he does work for set amounts of money. Only percentages of what the people are going to make. So he said, they brought me a substantial amount of money. And they were very happy with it, and I thought, thought it was very reasonable. But then my guide spared it says, ask them when they're going to give you the other $1,700 that is really yours. And he says to the folks, I would like to know now before we leave here, when will you have the $1,700 to give me that makes up my part of, you know, rightful part of, of, of the, uh, the, the deal. The wife fainted <laughs> and uh, the husband says, we'll have the money for you within 24 hours. So that was this type of phrase. So he was thanking the demons for helping him to know that. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Even spirits, yeah. Mm -hmm. At what point did this demon worship start to affect you personally, Roger? Well, <clears throat> it wasn't too long that the priest mentioned to us that uh, the time had arrived for us to start trusting the spirits and give the spirits a chance to work for us. And there was a number of gifts that you could choose from, you see. And um, I used to play the horses, some. Non, not knowledge, knowledgeable at all. I used to go to those bookies, you know, play the horses so often. But I said, hey, I would like to, to, to be able to, for the Spirit to, to instruct me on the, the numbers and the name of the horses that's going to win, you know, at Belmont or... Uh, some other uh, racetracks like that, <clears throat> make myself a little money. So the priest says, it'll be, it'll be given you. And sure enough, one night, I, I, where I fell into a trance or, or dreamed the thing, I don't know exactly what happened, but I, I saw three races that were really going to pay big. And these horses were, were, Dummies, so to speak. You know what I mean? They were not really good horses. They were like the one one ho horse paid twenty-one to one because he was that poor, right? The chance of winning was so poor that he paid twenty-one to one on him. And it showed me that I saw the 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 board at the bouquet and the number on it. And I went there, and uh, they said it was going to be on Saturday. Uh, that was like on Wednesday. A few days later, it was Saturday. I went there, and sure enough, there they were on the boards. I went to uh, uh, the wicket and uh, handed some money and, and uh, uh, got myself uh, a winner. Now I said, well, I'm, I'm a little crazy. I ought to put more money on there. So I, I, I put $20 onto the next horse, and that paid 21 to 1. So, you know, 
I left there with maybe four or five hundred dollars in my in my hands.